Uh, welcome to Brian Granger, who is with the Jupiter Lab project, who is here to talk us about Jupiter, Jupiter Lab, and all sorts of other interesting things. Fantastic. Thanks so much for having me here. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Great. And I'm going to click share screen on Blue Jeans. Share entire screen, start sharing. And can people see that? <laughs> Fantastic. And all right, you can even see all my different desktops, it looks like. Very good. So uh, I wanted to uh, talk about uh, a couple different aspects of Project Jupiter. Uh, I'll give a, a short introduction, uh, just sort of my own background. Uh, so originally I was trained as a theoretical computational atomic physicist. Uh, University of Colorado actually did my postdoc at the CFA at Harvard. Uh, there, for historical reasons, there's an atomic theory group there as well. So I've been in the halls of <laughs> labs like this many times, uh, although I'm not an astronomer or astrophysicist myself. I started working on open source software in the mid-2000s, 2004, 2005. Uh, the original creator of IPython, Fernando Perez, he and I were classmates in grad school. And so he had been sort of pitching me on Python for a long time and eventually I started to, to make the transition. Uh, and I've been working on IPython and now Jupyter um, pretty much as my main research activity um, for the last, um, well, since around 2010-ish. Um, I'm my Quote, a day job is a physics faculty at Cal Poly out in the central coast of California. Um, these days, I don't teach physics. I don't do physics research. I'm teaching in the, the data science program that Cal Poly has, and all of my research activities are Jupiter. Um, so that's sort of how I got to where I am. Um, and I, I'd like to take you back to this amazing user interface that I got to use all through graduate school that really motivated a lot of what's behind Jupiter, and uh, it's right here. Um, there you go. So uh, I think many scientists would recognize this user interface. Um, it's the terminal, and it, pretty much this is what we lived with I mean, all through grad school, a lot of my postdoc, and uh, we're all familiar when you like got an account on a new computer, you would SSH. So it's really SSH in combination with the terminal was the user interface, and actually it continues to be the primary user interface for many compute facilities, right? Beyond a laptop, these days still, most supercomputing facilities, most you know, HPC facilities, the user interface is still terminal. And uh, we had come from a background actually of using uh, Mathematica for years and years, all through undergrad, back to the late 80s, early 90s. And when we started to use Python, we realized, wow, from a language perspective, this is spectacular. From a, an environment perspective, this is, well, you've got the trouble. It was really <laughs> difficult. Um, and that's really what sort of got Fernando interested in Python and in building IPython. The original version of IPython was a command line program, which is uh, right here. So it was a very simple uh, command shell. Um, it had uh, tab completion, it had uh, built-in help, um, a lot of the things that we had grown used to in, in Mathematica, but here in the context of Python and uh, the terminal. And in the early 2000s, we quickly saw, wow, the, the web is actually a, a real uh, development platform. And so from around 2005, we started to do all the architectural uh, work required to offer this type of thing in the web browser. Uh, the first version of the IPython notebook at the time came out in 2000, uh, was it 2011. And at the time, it, again, it was called IPython uh, because we really were focused on Python. Uh, you could only run Python code in this. 
and uh, over the next two years, we uh, generalized everything so that you could basically run uh, any programming language that someone built a kernel for. Um, today, um, so here, let's see, actually, don't have to give the entire talk from the terminal. Um, so that's the wrong Chrome window. Um, and so uh, I, I would like this to be very much be a conversation. Um, I uh, have a lot of more formal slides, but I'm not sure that's going to be the most useful way of proceeding. Um, and so I want to sort of walk you through different parts of the Jupyter ecosystem. Um, and I, I think where I want to start um, is uh, showing you just a, a, a basic view of, of the Jupyter Notebook. And to do that, um, so this is a, a server we're running at Cal Poly. This is for a data science course that I'm teaching uh, called Data 301. Um, and I'm just going to go into some of the course materials that I have here. These are some uh, uh, notebooks from uh, a recent book that O'Reilly put out uh, by Jake Van Der Plas called Python Data Science Handbook. And so here are the notebook documents. Um, and so uh, what you can see here is we're getting a picture of the local Unix file system on this server. So I've got a regular Unix account here, um, and these are just the files sitting on, on the file system. Uh, the .ipymb files are notebook files. And let's see here. Let's look at Merge and Join. That's a, a nice notebook. And the, the core idea of the Jupyter Notebook is that of a computational narrative. Um, and what we mean by that is that in addition to the code and the data that someone's writing, there's a lot of other things around that, for, that form a narrative. Um, and that narrative is really important both in terms of uh, doing the original work, uh, create, doing the analysis or the visualization and recording uh, for yourself, but also in terms of communicating that result to other people. Um, and so here, uh, you know, this, this notebook here has live code, so we can run the Python code. Um, and actually, let's go here. Um, so here we're looking at uh, two different data frames, and this notebook is covering uh, SQL style merging and joining of pandas data frames. And uh, so we've got live code, but we also have everything around it. We've got, uh, in this case, HTML displays of tables. Uh, we've got narrative text. Uh, the, the Jupyter Notebook supports a wide range of different output formats. Um, so rather than just being able to have code that outputs uh, standard, uh, basically textual output to standard out or standard error, you can output essentially any MIME type um, that the browser can render. So here, this is uh, HTML output. You can have image-based output. You can have actual JavaScript-based output. So you can have like interactive visualizations as the result or, or side effect of running code. Um, and uh, when you bundle all this together into one of these notebook documents, that's sort of, we think of that as being a computational narrative. So it's a narrative that's built around live code uh, and data. So that's sort of the, the big picture uh, of the Jupyter Notebook. Um, the other little bits to mention here, so the, the narrative text um, is written in Markdown, um, and we do support uh, LaTeX in the middle of that, uh, if you've not seen that. Um, here's, here's laws uh, rendered there. So you can typeset arbitrarily complex mathematics um, in the middle of the Jupyter Notebook, uh, which for, for technical purposes, you really need that. Um, so it's sort of a, Markdown plus uh, the equation uh, typesetting part of, of LaTeX. So that's uh, a quick overview of, of sort of the idea of a notebook document. Um, again, it is a document. It, uh, on disk, it's uh, saved in a JSON format. Um, JSON uh, is, is, works really well for uh, data like this. Um, and you, so, you, again, being a document, you can email it, you can share it on Dropbox, you can version control it. Um, and so if you go to GitHub Python Data Science Handbook, so here's the Git repository that contains these notebooks of Jake. And if I go here and click on it, 
um, on any of these, uh, GitHub actually renders the JSON to uh, these, these notebook documents. Um, this is something that we, we've worked with them uh, to build into GitHub itself. They've done all the hard work. We advised them and gave them open source software to use. Um, and so that, that basically allows uh, a, a very simple workflow where uh, a scientist or a user is creating notebooks as part of their daily work, version controlling them, and simply by version controlling them, all of a sudden they are shareable and viewable by anyone in the world. Right? So you don't need Python installed. As long as you have a web browser, you can come here and start to at least look at what this person did. Um, now, obviously, you would want to go beyond, potentially would want to go beyond that to be able to run the code. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit about so how do people use the notebook? How do they install the notebook? Um, so it is a web application. Um, most of our users these days run it on their local system. Um, and let's see here. Um, so how most users would do that is they would uh, type Jupyter space notebook into a terminal. And this starts our server, which is based on Tornado, and they would get a, a Jupyter Notebook server running on their local system. So it's a web application, but all the files here are just the files on my Mac. Um, so it's sort of a, a hybrid experience. Um, most of our users, in terms of overall numbers, uh, use the notebook this way, uh, primarily because that's where their code and data is. Right? Their code and data is on their computer, and that's where they want to use it. Um, the uh, other uh, way that people are running it is more at an organizational level um, where they would host a centralized server. And so I want to talk um, briefly about that. And so that, that's how I'm running uh, this server here. Um, and so I want to actually, I'm not going to log out because I have GitHub uh, two-factor authentication. It would be a pain to log back in for... <laughs> Um, but I'll show you the control panel. So uh, this is the control panel or the admin panel of a Jupyter Hub instance. So this is a, a live server that we're using for the data science course. Um, I, I'll talk more about sort of the underlying architecture of Jupyter Hub, but it's basically a, a multi-user version of the Jupyter notebook that you can install on a centralized server and offer a consistent uh, experience for all of the, the users there. Um, you can uh, use Docker uh, to deploy this, or you don't have to. Uh, this, this particular server um, does not use Docker. Um, it, it's not needed for a situation like this. There's basically one, one environment that everyone's using. Um, everyone is a more or less trusted user. Uh, if the students misbehave, I can penalize their grades. So it's, it's, it's a fairly safe, confined, and I don't have to worry about running sort of development, production, uh, different builds, or things like that. So it, there's no need for Docker. Um, and uh, this particular Jupyter Hub instance is set up using OAuth, and in particular GitHub OAuth. So uh, all users need is a GitHub uh, username. Uh, and so actually what I'll do right now is I'll give one of you access. So does someone have a GitHub username that I can add? Sure. Um, Crossing. Like that? All right. So if you go to data301.calpolydatascience.org, you can use your GitHub credentials to log in and get a live notebook server. Um, the authentication layer of Jupyter Hub is fully pluggable. Um, so we support uh, out of the box uh, PAM authentication, so just the built in Unix, Linux uh, authentication. Uh, OAuth, and then a, uh, a lot of other people have built different authenticators for different uh, settings. And so there's a basically a class that you would subclass and add your custom authentication logic to manage users. Um, here, actually, at well, actually not on this server. We have a different server at Cal Poly um, that we're using Active Directory. I don't imagine a scientific collaboration like this is embracing out of directory, uh, but obviously some organizations are, and, and that's a really important usage yeah. case. Um, so the the uh, authentication is pluggable in Jupyter Hub, and the spawning of the single user notebook servers is also uh, pluggable. So I want to show you that. So if I go here uh, like this, 
this takes me to this page. And so this is the page that an individual user would see um, when they log in after they authenticate with GitHub. Um, and basically, there's only a few things they can do. Most of them are not admin users, so they wouldn't see this. They can basically st start their server or stop their server. Um, my server is already running here, so I click on my server. And now uh, I go here um, to see uh, the actual server. And so this, again, I'm running on a remote server. This particular server is on Rackspace and has uh, 128 gigs of RAM and like two terabytes uh, of disk space. Um, and so it's more than sufficient for, uh, I guess we have 60 students this quarter. Is there any quotaing or any kind of resource management? Not in this server. Um, there is a number of ways uh, of, of imposing quotas. Uh, one would be to use Docker. Um, we also have a new uh, spawner uh, that's based on system D and uh, that also has uh, resource resource management uh, quota type things. Um, in this context, it doesn't it's not too bad actually. I mean I, I have to be a little bit careful and monitor RAM usage, um, but students are pretty good. Five minutes before the deadline of some submission, it all goes crazy. It? <laughs> it's not. It, it, it actually hasn't been too bad. I mean, it, it's the, 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 the students, not astronomers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, when you uh, when when you start a, a server, that's the Jupiter uh, server, the the server essentially for the for the web page, um, and then does this allow? It's presumably also pluggable with different backends. You can have the IPython backend, the, the kernel. You can have a, a Julia kernel or a, um, an R kernel, right? Those are all also pluggable, yeah. I assume. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, JupyterHub will automatically pick up any installed kernel. So this JupyterHub deployment has the bash kernel, the Python 3 kernel, and the R kernel. Um, but yeah, you and you know any of the kernels and then any of the, the libraries available for those kernels are available to all users. Um, and then, so um, a, go ahead. Go ahead. So the, when the when the kernel process is running, um, it's uh, you said you're not using containers uh, at on this particular instance. So what user ID does the is the kernel process running as? Yeah, that, that's a great question. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to open up a terminal here. So this is a web-based terminal, um, and it points at my user account here. And if I do who am I, I'm Ellison BG. Um, my current directory is home slash Ellison BG. And so for this particular authenticator, uh, it maps the GitHub usernames to the local Unix names. And so it cr just creates a user for each GitHub username, and you've got a full shell account um, for that system. So there's, you know, from that perspective, it's... So the, the spawner um, that you're using in this case is uh, running a set UID and, and actually Sets the the user ID of the Python kernel subprocess to be to match the your login ID. Essentially, yes, it, it happens one level higher, in that the the server the the main Jupyter Hub server starts an entire single user notebook server that itself spawns the kernels, and the okay. entire single user server is running as oh, okay. me. Okay. Yeah. And, and right now, since you just created an account for Frothy, um, has this thing actually, um, in the meantime, or maybe the first time she logs in, creating an account for, for Frothy on that system? I, I just I just checked, and it does. I can start the terminal and type who am I, and it says Frothy. Okay, so it, it created a new Unix user ID and assigned a, a number to it, and then that will be persistent on that on that system. Yes. Yep. Um, so yeah, it's, it's. I mean, I'm running nightly backups on this system, uh, just like you would on a, uh, a, a standard Linux server, um, and so they're they're fully fully persistent. Um, now, when you're running, you know, if you wanted to use the Docker-based spawner or Kubernetes or other things like that, um, 
then the question of data persistence and sort of what files get mounted into those containers is something you have to answer. I mean, it's a solvable problem, but it's not automatically done for you. You have to sort of build out the infrastructure and decide what mount points get mounted inside the containers and so on. In this case, a single Unix server fits the bill for us. But there's complete flexibility in how you set that up. So the next thing is sort of the idea of building blocks, right? The notebook is one possible building block that scientists need for doing interactive computing and working with data. A terminal is actually another, right? I mean, they're going to possibly have make files, need to run C compilers, need to issue git commands. I mean, there's no substitute for a standard terminal. And this is a full-blown terminal. You can run VI inside of this, inside the web browser. The other thing you would need is just regular text files, right? Not everything is in a notebook. And so we have a text editor in the web browser. This isn't a particularly exciting text file. Let's see what I have here that I can show. Yeah. So can someone actually pip install packages they need for their notebooks through that terminal? Is that something that... Yes. Is that how someone like gets... They would have to be a little bit careful in doing like dash dash user. Right. But yes, absolutely. There's no... I mean, it's a full Unix account in the full sense of the word. If they try to system-wide pip install, they're going to get permission errors and so on. The default configuration that we're running with is that users don't have actual shell access. So they can't like from a regular terminal SSH to the server. But you... Well, depends on... So the spawner, the default spawner does not have passwords enabled. And so you probably have to set up SSH keys and things like that. But there's flexibility with that as well. So again, these different building blocks of notebooks, terminals, text editors, basically what do people need to get work done with data interactively? And what we have found over time is that users need these building blocks, but they often need them at the same time. They need a more flexible workflow. And to address that, we've started to build, or we've been building actually for almost two years now, a new front end for Jupyter. But actually, before I show that, I want to talk a little bit more about deployment of Jupyter Hub. And in terms of sort of what does it take to deploy Jupyter Hub, both in terms of best case scenarios and worst case scenarios. Best case scenario would be no containers, a single server, right? A very simple setup, either PAN authentication or GitHub or Google OAuth. Something like that is quite easy. And what we've done is create these Ansible roles and scripts here. And the core logic that you have to customize is this host vars file. And you can look at here. So we're using this for teaching purposes. But the fact that it's being used for teaching is sort of a side effect of it. It works perfectly fine for people who are not using it in teaching. And so you can set the home directory of user accounts, the Jupyter Hub admin users, regular Jupyter Hub users. You can pick which kernels. It comes default with configurations for Python 3, R, and Bash. A small amount of security configuration. And then you can list things like which Conda packages do you want to install, which PIP packages, which CRAN packages for the R kernel. And then there's a bunch of optional stuff. So do you want to enable OAuth? There's this grading stuff that's teaching specific. The default is to not install it. You can call idle notebook servers. So if you want to make sure that when users are done with their notebooks that that memory gets reclaimed, you can call according to some policy. And then you can specify local mount points. And you can optionally configure Nginx, which we use as a proxy here. 
uh, for, to do standard public HTML directories. Um, uh, and so it's, it's a fairly simple setup. Uh, once the prerequisites for running this Ansible setup, um, right now we're testing it on latest Ubuntu builds. Um, and basically you need a server with uh, a domain name, uh, a public domain name, and then uh, optionally an SSL certificate. Um, if you don't want to actually purchase an SSL certificate, we do have support down here somewhere for Let's Encrypt, which will grab a, an SSL cert on the fly. Um, so basically, if, if you have a, a server with a DNS address, a sort of a fresh Ubuntu install, um, th running these Ansible scripts, the base install takes between 10 and 15 minutes. Um, where all the time goes in is depending on which Python, R, et cetera, packages you want to install. That can take another two hours, depending on sort of what, where you want. And so it's, it's actually a fairly quick process. Um, and so that's sort of on the easy side, sort of a real Jupyter Hub install where all the best practices in terms of security deployment have been encoded in these Ansible scripts. Um, in terms of the, the sort of where does it go from there, uh, it would be customizing the spawning uh, to use other spawners, either Docker or Kubernetes or the system D. Um, and then when you get into some of those spawners, you can start to launch these launch notebook servers across multiple backend servers. So if you want to scale up beyond just a single server, um, then you're getting into figuring out, okay, how do we deploy and, and scale up? Um, and for example, uh, at UC Berkeley, they've got a new initiative called Data8. Um, and they're basically starting to teach data science to every student on campus, which includes obviously all the, you know, the sciences and engineering, but also English majors, philosophy majors, history wow. majors. And they're doing all of this based on uh, a massive Jupyter Hub deployment. Uh, they're based on Kubernetes, um, and they have done a lot of work to sort of automate and also reproduce these uh, deployments. Um, the, being able to reproduce it is really important to them because they have to do this many, many times, right? Multiple terms each year, multiple classes. So they need a very sort of robust, scalable, reproducible system. And uh, I, I'm not going to pull it up here. There's a bunch of repos that are involved in their deployment, um, but they've built a really nice system. Um, and there's a lot sort of at that scale, there's a lot of moving pieces. But a lot of those pieces are already in place and, and sort of exist. It's more a question of assembling all the pieces for a particular sort of deployment scenario. And all those repos are on GitHub? Yeah, 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 awesome. absolutely. Yeah, that's um, some of them. So we have a Jupyter Hub uh, organization on GitHub, and a lot of those are uh, on the Jupyter Hub. So we've got the Kubernetes spawner, LDAP Authenticator, System D spawner, a batch spawner. Um, there's the Docker spawner, um, a wrap spawner. Um, so there's quite a bit of flexibility. Um, and so there's even the flexibility for, to run, uh, basically run multiple spawners um, and present a user interface to the users on which one they want to use. So if you had different deployments based on different images, in Docker or Kubernetes, you could allow users to pick. I want, you know, I want the production server. I want the, or the production image or development image or a particular version. Um, and then I'm pretty sure the. Let's. I, I'd have to hunt a little bit more. I know they have some deployment repositories themselves um, that that are also uh, a part of this. Um, and so the, the way I, I view Jupyter Hub is it's a bunch of extensible APIs and then building blocks that plug into those APIs for different deployments. Um, it's definitely not a one size fits all, um, sort of only one thing. We built it in a way that you can customize it to your heart's content. Um, we, we have some people uh, using this at Brookhaven. Um, on one of their big experiments where they have multiple beam lines and their Jupyter Hub instance, uh, the users are presented with a UI when they log in 
and they can pick which beam line they want to spawn their server. And so when they get launched, their single user server will get launched on the compute resources for that beam line that has all the data, everything they need. Um, and so you, in that case, they're doing both sort of virtual segmenting of their users, but also physical segment. There's a, a physical beam line, a physical facility that's involved in a, in a particular spotter configuration. So another question more on the user perspective. What's the idea for sharing uh, notebooks among users? Great question. Um, so uh, right now, in terms of stable Jupyter deployments, the, the best option is GitHub. Um, it's not not a wonderful option for many users, um, and but that's traditionally how a lot of us are sharing notebooks. It's just version control them and and do that. Um, there's a, a couple of things we have in, in process. One is uh, we're we're building uh, real time collaboration into the Jupyter notebook, and so this would be Google Doc style. Multiple users working on a single notebook. Um, our, our initial implementation is based on the Google Real Time APIs and Google Drive. Nice. And so, in that case, you literally have uh, Google, all the files that you have on Google Drive, the notebooks there, multiple users can open them, um, and it, it works just like you would expect Google Drive to work with Jupyter Notebooks. That's not released yet, um, but it is working. Like our, our postdoc at Berkeley has that working, and it, it's it's a real thing. Um, that I think so. One using uh, Google APIs is not going to be viable for everyone. Um, like there's a lot of you know, companies with proprietary data that there's no way they're going to do that. Right. I'm sorry. So. You're, if the editing is going on in Google, but the the Jupyter backend that's doing all the calculations isn't on Google, so uh, so no, the all the editing, so the the it will look just like Jupyter, but we're making calls out to the Google Real Time API to synchronize a notebook between two different users. Okay. So it's still like the standard Jupyter interface. Um, now there are questions about, I mean the. Standard Google Drive only knows about documents. It doesn't know about compute. Yeah. And so there are questions about when you're sharing a document with someone, are you sharing compute? Do each of you have your own kernel? And we're still working out sort of the best ways of exposing those things. Um, I, I'm guessing by the end of 2017, we'll have a, a, some sort of pre-release of the real-time collaboration. Um, the, the postdoc may, may smack me for saying that, <laughs> um, but, but it's already worked. Like, we've seen some really nice demos. Now, whether it's going to be sort of public stable release yet, I, I don't, that's more difficult to say. Um, but, but on the time scale of the LFST, <laughs> I think all of that will be working very, very well. Okay. Yeah. We're, we're used to working with a lot of tech companies where their time scales are like, can we have it yesterday? <laughs> and, uh, but yeah. Speaking of collaboration, have you is there any discussion with GitHub about improving pull requests for notebooks? Because aren't they a little opaque, like GitHub's diffs and line comments and? Yes. So um, it's like we, using like the MB dime. Yeah, exactly. And doing that on GitHub. And yeah. So you we talked about collaboration before. Yeah. So MB dime. So so. Uh, uh, version control systems such as GitHub are line-based. Uh, they're not great. Uh, you can version control JSON and other sort of structured data, but it's not wonderful. For example, there's no guarantee that uh, a merge or a rebase is going to lead to a valid JSON file. Right? Git, Git does not know anything about JSON syntax or HTML. Or, um, and uh, so uh, some of our uh, core developers in Norway have developed NB-DIME, um, and it is basically a, a, a set of libraries for working with and version controlling notebooks. Um, most of the way that I use them is as a, uh, a Git uh, diff tool and a merge tool. So I, you install it and enable it with Git, and then you forget about it. And it basically makes diffing and merging notebooks work like you would expect. Um, 
In particular, things like you often want to uh, diff and merge notebooks ignoring output, right? only paying attention to source code. That's a, a perfect example. Um, and uh, so it's coming along nicely. Uh, we, I think we're trying to start having conversations with GitHub um, about eventually incorporating this. So, so diffing and merging and, and is nice. Um, part of it is that I, I, I don't imagine they're going to be interested in doing that until MB Dime is quite stable. Yeah. Um, and we're, we're getting there, but probably not quite there. So. So uh, I don't know, any other questions about sort of multi-user deploying Jupyter, that side of things? Great. So what I want to talk about now more is back down at the, the level of single user notebooks. Um, so uh, again, the, the, this is a classic Jupyter notebook and it has these sort of core components or core building blocks for interactive computing, a file browser, um, text files, terminals, notebooks. Um, and uh, But you're, a user is very constrained in terms of how they use those building blocks together. The constraint in the classic notebook is basically one per browser tab. Right? And so if you're working in one notebook and you want to look at another notebook, it's even something like that is uh, fairly, fairly difficult. Um, the other issue is the classic notebook. Um, again, web development was a very different Thing back in 2011 when we wrote the notebook. Um, we were not imagining anyone would ever look at our JavaScript code. <laughs> um, it was written with uh, sort of jQuery and Bootstrap. And uh, as a result, it's sort of a, a bit of a rat's nest of code. Like it wasn't, we didn't clearly delineate public APIs versus public APIs. And that makes it a, a sort of a painful platform to extend. And that's something that a lot of people are wanting to do to customize it uh, for their own needs. So this, this idea of being able to work with the building blocks in a more flexible way and then extensibility, um, we started to create a new front end. And uh, I have it running right here, right alongside. Uh, it's just at lab. And so it's called Jupyter Lab. Um, and uh, right now, uh, we're expecting to have a beta out uh, of Jupyter Lab in uh, sometime mid late March. Um, it's to the point now where we ourselves are starting to use it quite heavily. Um, and uh, then we're going to have a 1.0 release sometime mid year. And our, our, our 1.0 release, sort of the, the metric for that, is full feature parity with the classic notebook. Um, so basically, everything you can do in a classic notebook, you'll be able to do here, plus some additional things. Um, and so I want to just walk through a bit of uh, Jupyter Lab. Um, and so first of all, let's see here, um, show you the basic building blocks. So uh, here we have notebooks. So here is a standard Python based notebook. Um, we've got a, a top level menu here with notebook specific things. Um, uh, all of the standard things that you would want in the classic notebook. So if you're using Matplotlib or OK or whatever visualization library, all of that is going to basically be working uh, here, uh, or already is working or will be working um, in that. And I can show some, some more complex notebooks. Um, let's see here. Uh, import. Quick question. Um, yeah. Is the JSON format for the notebook the same between? The yes, it's classic and the lab. Yes, so so <laughs> it's very important yeah. to mention what what changes, what doesn't. Yeah. The uh, the only thing that changes is the client, the web-based client. The notebook document format is the same. The kernels are the same. The backend server is identical. The only thing is the the view. Great. Um, and so that that was a an invariant constraint that we had to respect in this process. This is why you can switch between classic and lab. Without any exactly. Yeah. No. It, yeah. This is literally two interfaces on on the same backend server um, without any problem. And, and part of this is that we've recognized there's going to be a transition period where we're both still maintaining the classic notebook, but users are starting to use Lab, and some users may still need to fire up uh, the classic notebook. And we don't want there to be any 
most users will have both available, I think. Um, so it has, you know, NumPy dot, uh, there's tab completion, there's random dot, um, dot rand, uh, there's uh, tool tips, all the things you would, would want and expect of uh, the classic notebook. Um, but then you can also do a lot of additional things. So for example here, uh, let's say I want to just move this cell, I can just do drag and dock, drop. Um, or you can do multiple selections and drag things around. Um, let's just create some more cells here. So I'll create multiple cells and then you can just drag those. So drag and drop interactions uh, are now possible within the notebook. Um, so there's a, a lot more flexibility. Um, so that's one of the building blocks. Uh, the next building block um, is the code console. So this is actually a, a building block that, that traditionally existed in, in IPython and Jupyter, but we hadn't implemented in the classic notebook. So this is more of a traditional, just terminal driven uh, type thing. So it, there's no, there's no going back. Uh, you're not creating a document here. There's no file in the file system. It's more like a, a computational scratch pad. So, uh, but again, all of the, the, the rich output, everything uh, that you would want. So you can say what the uh, percent map plot lib in line, um, import map.lib.pyplot as plot, plot.plot, range 10. And everything is just gonna work. Tab completion works, tool tips. It's, it's the same building blocks of output input areas, just exposed in a slightly different user interface. Um, there's a, a text editor component, um, so no, no great surprise with that. Um, and then there's a terminal component as well. So now you've got all these different components um, in one, uh, sort of one user interface. The important thing though is the, the flexibility. So let's say um, I need a terminal open and I wanna be able to work with uh, a notebook at the same time. And so this is uh, a, a full-blown tabbed um, and paneled uh, layout system. Um, it's very flexible. Um, if you have, uh, let's see here, let's say I have another notebook um, and I say, you know what, I want this, uh, this cell over here in this notebook. Okay. So things like that are really difficult to do in a web app between browser tabs inside of a single browser tab, it's, it's not a problem. Um, so again, same building blocks but in a more flexible context that allows users to assemble them and work with them in different ways. Um, so let's see here. Um, I want to go over here. Check it out. Demo. Um, so let's see. Um, so let's open this markdown file. So here's a markdown file, right? Um, a standard markdown file. Um, the first thing you might want to do is say, you know what, I, I, that's nice to edit raw markdown, but I'd like to see it, right? And so notice what I did. I right clicked, and what we built is a very general system for file types um, and models based on those file types, and then different renders and editors for those file types. And so a single file type can have both a default editor or render and then other optional render. So here, uh, the default render or editor for Markdown is just a text file interface, um, but there's also a rendered Markdown. And most importantly, those two views are synchronized. So as I uh, type, it automatically updates the Markdown view. Again, this is sort of modern web development at like it should work. <laughs> yeah, and, and so this is, I guess, pluggable with an API. So like, absolutely. If like our org uses restructured text, I can like create a restructured text backend, maybe. Or no, but ask you in the browser. And well, it up. well, no. So if for for browser. restructured text, yeah. you could create a what we would call a server extension. Okay. That could then render it on the server and send back. Um, but okay. yeah, no, you you could that that would definitely be possible. <laughs> yeah. The the issue with restructured text is that. Uh, you can't render it incrementally. Yeah. Um, you sort of have to render all an entire document, um, and then the only renders I know of are, are 
server side, Python based server side. Um, so, um, and all of these APIs, uh, again, are extensible. Right? So we've got very uh, sort of carefully architected APIs that are public. Um, and so anyone can come along and say, hey, I've got this weird file, file format and I want a viewer or, or an editor for that. As an example, um, this last summer at the SciPy conference, there were some astronomers there and they said, hey, we know of a JavaScript based FITS file render. And these two developers who had never done web development before, um, at the end of one day, could double click in JupyterLab on the FITS file and it would bring up a very nice uh, FITS file viewer. Um, I don't have a link to that right now, but so things like that uh, are possible. This is crying out for you to have a convert to notebook button. And, uh, yeah, and, and this is the other, I mean, we're just getting started with this <laughs> stuff, but yes, you'd like, I mean, the whole reason you want these building blocks together is to be able to go back and forth, yeah. right? I mean, you may start working in a console and realizing, gosh, I actually want this as a notebook. <laughs> Things like that are are not going to be a problem. Um, it'll be really easy. Um, so, but you might, I mean, even just a simple example of that type of thing, um, here we have a uh, Python code in the markdown file, right? It would be nice if we could run that. Um, so if you go over here to the command palette to the editor, we can say create console for editor. There's also a shortcut for this. And let's put this over here. And now if I select the line of code here and press shift enter, it sends it to that console, hmm. right? And so now I can say, oh, here's another block. Let's run that block. Um, I want to actually create a data frame. Um, but in some sense, you've already annotated the markdown to tell it where the Python is. So we have an issue open for that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, we yeah we we want to do automatic uh, block detection basically. Yeah. yeah. So if you put it anywhere within that, um, it would magically work. So we'll do a plot based on that. Um, again, so. One example of being able to combine these different building blocks in useful ways. Part of what we hear from users often is that the notebook is great, but it only goes so far. Eventually, you have to start doing real software engineering or writing documentation. And right now, the there's a huge gap between working a notebook and having sort of production ready, unit tested, deployed software. And so being able to assemble these different building blocks is part of the picture that, that we're working on to address that those needs. Um, another example, I tried this earlier and it was a little painful, but let's see here. So uh, another example of a custom file viewer is CSV, right? Um, so if I just double click on a CSV file, this will not be fast. This is the part. Um, so this is actually a very large CSV file. And I'm, I'm deliberately clicking on this large CSV file. Let me actually, well, this does that. Let's go back here and I'll show you something else. Um, so the, the file browser here. Um, so for example, here's a file. I can click on it, uh, right click on it, and there's some diff different actions. Um, we support multiple selection and actions on files. Uh, we also support drag and drop, so I can drag this, put it there, move the file in the file system. Um, and so we, we really are working hard to provide a, a, sort of a usable uh, web app uh, experience. And the big challenge here is to, to keep things simple. Right? I mean, it, it's very easy to build complex user interfaces in the name of getting something as powerful. Um, but I think one of the attractions of the Jupyter Notebook has been it's not overly complex. And so we're really working hard to keep it uh, as simple as possible. There's intrinsic complexity, right? I mean, when someone has, you know, 100 complex notebooks, like that, there's nothing we can do about the intrinsic complexity but we want to make sure that we're not layering our own level of complexity on top of that, sort of uh, allowing the user to focus on the content that they're working with. 
again, like I said, you need to. I, uh, yeah. Can I ask you a question about this? The file browser uh, pane on the on the left. I mean, it's more than a file browser, but but you know what I mean. The the, the leftmost yes. pane. Um, yep. it, so when you showed off the drag and drop in particular, um, that means that the UI has a notion of. That these really are folders. That, that there's a you know that you if you drop something on a folder, it can it can go into it. And I'm wondering, is that represented somehow by a sufficiently rich abstraction layer that it would be straightforward to make this work on top of something other than a POSIX file system on the back end? That you could make it work on top of an object store or on top of a you know web dev or VO space or something like that. Yes, absolutely. Um, so there's a couple different layers of abstractions. Uh, the lowest level layer, um, let's see, JupyterJS services. So uh, we have a project called uh, uh, JupyterLab slash services or JupyterJS services. And this is a JavaScript library that abstracts out all the backend operations. One of those uh, is the file system. Um, so that is our contents APIs, and uh, so this right here, this file contains the JavaScript implementation of that API, and the default implementation talks to our own server, um, which has a REST API based on that, but uh, Ian Rose, actually, the, this is the grad student who's been working on the uh, Google Docs or Google Drive implementation, he's written uh, an implementation of that uh, interface that talks to Google Drive instead. And so, yes, like if you want to store notebooks on S3 or in some other back end, that's not a problem. And uh, we've heard from Ian that once he swapped that out, uh, the file browser worked perfectly fine. And actually, he was able to do it in a way that it doesn't replace this file browser, but adds a second file browser. So a user can look through both their uh, files on their native system and the ones in Google Drive. And so uh, the sort of what's going on in, under the hood there, um, one, everything in Jupyter Lab is based on uh, models and views. And so we're basically swapping out models, keeping the same views. Um, the other is uh, we, because we knew people were going to be extending this a lot, we wanted a, a very clean, uh, and sort of robust way of uh, denoting public interfaces and types. And so we built JupyterLab on TypeScript. Um, and that's a, we're actually very, very happy with that. And it's, it's sort of enabling us to scale the software development process um, really, really well. Um, now, if you know, have tooling based on other things like Angular or ReactJS, it works fine uh, inside of this. Uh, we already have, I guess, I, right now I don't have anything installed, any extensions installed that are using React, but but we have some of those, and it, it's not a problem. Yeah, so um, we have a we have a very extensive React-based application um, yeah, here sure. that that's broken down into a, um, a, a bunch of separate modules that interact with each other. With each other, yeah. And yeah. build into a custom web application framework. Um, but it would be extremely natural for these these pieces. There, we've got a, a, an image viewer and a tabular data viewer, and um, you know a, 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 a x y plot and histogram uh, viewer yep. to be treated as these modules that you have in a in the Jupyter Lab. Um, so that, for instance, if you had an image file, the default viewer for that image file would be our image viewer, right? Those those, those kinds of things. So I mean, yeah. this is really very directly applicable for what to what we're wanting to build. As long as it has enough abstractions a level down to you know to let us um, put yeah. it on top of, of our data services. Our data. The, the the core uh, TypeScript object we has has basically a, a DOM node attached to it, and you can render whatever content you want to into that DOM node, and so it. it Integrating it with React is, is quite simple. Um, other things that, that JupyterLab provides that, that were actually the, some of the most difficult things wasn't the rendering necessarily, 
but things like uh, building robust menus. Um, so a great example of this is um, implementing menus in a way, uh, this is going to be hard because there's a delay between what I see on my screen and up there, um, such that uh, there's grace in terms of being able to cross outside the boundary of sub submenus and it doesn't close the submenu. Right? Native OS menus just do that, right? But getting web browsers to do things like that is really challenging. Um, we also have a, uh, a command system. So this would be similar to the command palettes or command systems in a lot of the other text editors um, that allow a uh, basic hit command shift P and then uh, start typing commands. Um, so you can see a new terminal and then hit that and open a new terminal. Um, the, uh, and so any extension to JupyterLab can declare its own commands. And the other thing we built is uh, proper keyboard handling that in principle could support international keyboards. Um, it, when we started to build this, we assumed like, well, surely someone has solved this problem. And there wasn't. It's, it's actually horrific. It, it's horrific. Like the state of keyboard handling in the browser is, yeah, really, really bad. Um, and so uh, any of these plugins, uh, you know, whether it's a custom file type handler or some custom visualization, um, can access the menu system, the command palette, the keyboard shortcut, and they're all integrated. So when you add a new uh, command and a new keyboard shortcut, all you have to do is specify which command you want to appear in the menu, and we automatically pull the keyboard shortcut for that and hook it up to the command system. And so there's all this sort of application scaffolding it doesn't have anything to do with rendering things into the DOM that we built up as part of this. Um, what else? Um, other questions? Um, i trying to think of other things. Oh, I was going to show the CSV file. So I had clicked on this VSV file, and it took a while. And the reason is that it is uh, 1.1 million rows. And uh, so the thing that I want to emphasize here is um, a couple things. One, we can't hide the fact that that large CSV file had to be loaded over the network into the browser. Um, obviously, here, we're only displaying the first 1,000 rows. Like, we look at the length of the file. Uh, we're using D3's CSV parser and then rendering a thousand, um, but it's still the, the user experience is fairly decent. Still, um, this is just the start. What we'd like to do, and, and we're, we already have people working on it, is to build uh, basically virtual scrolling uh, into different things here. Um, and word has it that uh, we will be able to offer smoothly scrolling interfaces across billions of lines of data. And so this is something we're, we're actively working on. Um, but for now, still, it, it, part of what we found is uh, users will just click on files, right? They won't look to see, oh, how big is the CSV file? How big is this image file? And so we're trying to provide user interfaces that, are, that have some guards and make it a little bit friendly and, and still usable. But it's still useful to be able to, to double click on a CSV file and see it rendered and explore the columns, even though you're not going to uh, see uh, all of the uh, rows uh, for the file. Um, let's see, JupyterLab demo files. I'm going to close this. Um, let's see, what else did I want to mention? Let me see, this is file handlers, building blocks. Um, oh, so uh, a bit more about extensions and what can be done. So I apologize, I don't have a better screenshot of it. Um, so uh, this is an example uh, of an extension that we built with the folks at Continuum, and in particular de the developers of Bokeh and Dask. Um, uh, I think you're all familiar with Bokeh. Uh, Dask is a, a, a 
called a parallel computing library, a graph-based uh, parallel computing library. And uh, Dask ships with um, bouquet visualizations, real-time bouquet visualizations that show the execution of a Dask graph on a cluster. And uh, Matt Rockland came to us and said, hey, like, yeah, I can open up the standard bouquet web app and view it. I'd like to have this uh, individual widgets from that bouquet app in Jupyter Lab right alongside the code. And so we worked with them to build uh, a Jupyter Lab extension. And what you can see here is, uh, and obviously this is a large screen, um, but basically uh, multiple panels where you've got different individual bouquet uh, visualizations, uh, real-time updating as you run the visualization in the above notebook. And so that's one example. And sort of the, the, the distant thing we're pointing at is, uh, for lack of a better word, it's really dashboarding, right? Where at some point someone wrote some code that caused something nice or useful to show up on the screen, a visualization, a table, right? But in the current incarnation, you don't want to look at the code. You want to look at the result of that code running against a new data set or a real-time feed of data. Yeah. And the user who, who's currently looking at that may not be technical and code-oriented, or they may be code-oriented and just say, but I don't want to look at code right now. That's not my goal. My goal is to understand why is the telescope doing what it's doing, or why am I seeing this artifact in this image? Um, and so that is definitely a direction we're headed and we're sort of building up the different pieces to, to make that possible. Um, I had a quick question. Uh, yeah. This sounds a lot like the um, methodology that the browser uses itself. Um, the browser is very spoke, focused on an end result, and if you want to look at the code that's running it, you can you know, right-click and view source, but the primary objective is to view the output of all that code. But secondarily, the browser also has the URL bar, which is just as important for someone who's walking by and sees a screen and says, that's interesting. I'd like to find out more about that. Um, the URL is right there. It's visible. It's easily accessible. If I were at this conference and I saw this screen up and running, how would I be able to say, oh, wow, I'd like to follow up on that, or I can use that maybe, and let me try it out when I get back to the office. What's the means in which I can then you know, find this again uh, on my own later? So, so a couple of things. One would be um, just the notebooks themselves, right? That the notebooks will continue to be the sort of atomic unit of sharing. Um, so, for example, if you got this DAS notebook and were able to run it on a system that had the right things installed, you would see this this exact thing. Now, you may have to rearrange the panels and you know, to get it looking exactly like that. Um, we're not quite there yet, um, so what we've done is um, added to Jupyter Lab um, notions of session, and the session is able to basically serialize the relevant parts of the user interface state and then repopulate the user interface based on that state. And so what I'm going to do right now is refresh my browser tab to show you what state we're currently preserving. Um, it's not going to be complete here. Um, so what you'll notice when I refresh and reload, what's going to happen right now, it tracks the documents that were open and the state of the UI, but we're losing right now the layout of the main panel area here. Um, we're working on that, and that, that's something we basically just haven't come up with a serialization format for this layout area. And so in principle, eventually we will have like a declarative session notion that could save even things like the layout of Jupyter Lab. We're not we're definitely not there yet. Um, but that that could be something that we allowed users to share as well. Could like a user account have multiple sessions? I think we're definitely so going like, to implement that. Yeah. There's so, no so one of them could be like um, a read-only session that, like, the telescope actually provides, which is like a dashboard into the help of the telescope. And then another is like your working environment. Yeah. That you can change. Yeah. I mean, and, and even you know, uh, IDEs. I, mean, I, I use Visual Studio Code right now for a lot, and they have this 
essentially they call it a folder, but it's you know, a, a directory and the, the current view of the, the files in that directory. And I, I absolutely, I mean, all of us sort of have different projects we're working on and to have sort of a, a default layout and set of files that, that are tracked for that particular project. So yeah, I, I, we're, we're definitely planning on doing that. We're, part of what we're trying to do is balance the need for us to get a 1.0 out that has full feature parity um, with all these fun new things. And we're, we're trying to be fairly disciplined and focus on like, let's get 1.0 out and then like go and add all these fun things. But it's the new shiny things are distracting for us. All right. Um, does anybody have any other um, on the record questions? Otherwise, I'm going to terminate the recording and we can chit chat. Okay, I, I would like to thank Brian for taking the time to come all the way here, and especially since it was dramatic in the end, um, and taking the time. And this, this is absolutely fascinating, and uh, we'll look forward to talking to him some more in a minute.